to be 
saved. Again, all women, all boys, all girls, all people. He will have all people to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of truth. Let's read that one more time. I exhort thee, the Apostle Paul was led to write, that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings, and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we do thank you for everything that you've given us. God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for allowing us to gather here this morning to worship you. God, you are truly worthy to be praised. God, you loved us so much. You sent your son to endure misery, pain, and separation on the face of this earth so that we, poor wretched sinners, come to know you, have a relationship with you, and live eternally in the peace and the protection of heaven. God, you loved us so much. God, I pray that you allow us to realize this morning that you have called us to live for you. Those that are, are washed in the blood of, of the Lamb, you have given us a mission to tell others the good news of the gospel of Christ. You have given us a mission to pray for them. God, I pray that you burden us today. May it be that we can increase the effectiveness this very day simply by surrendering ourselves to you and praying for you to move in the lives of those around us. God, whatever it be that you have for each one of us, I pray that you, you hide me behind the cross that you allow them not to hear my delivery, but that you allow each person here to hear your message. In the way that you, the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, will take it and directly apply it to their heart. God, allow us not to be here at all, but allow us to move, to receive your word, to apply it to our lives so that we can make an impact in the kingdom of heaven. Thank you for everything you've done. God, thank you for everything you're going to do. Please bless this church, protect our ministries. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. I exhort therefore that first of all, supplication, <coughs> prayer, intercession, and giving thanks be made to all people. I'm going to start off with just kind of an expository covering of these four verses. I don't know about you, but again, I find myself guilty this week of mumbling and grumbling and complaining about a lot of things. And if I could just learn to stop and just take this particular verse and place it in my heart, before I ever get around to mumbling and grumbling and complaining, uh, of wondering what the end of my life is going to be, if I could ever learn to come to the point in my Christian walk with God to allow my first thought and my first action to be to follow my knees and pray, to follow my knees and, and, and make intercession for not only myself and my family and our church, but the, the world around us, I would find myself in the heart of giving thanks to God. And I think I would find my demise, my stress, and my anger a whole lot less. God has called us, first of all, to pray. Second verse, for kings, for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and acceptable a peaceful life in godliness and honesty. That verse is clear. The verse means exactly what it says. All people deserve for the Christians on the face of this earth to fall before God in prayer 
and ask for him to make intercession and ask for his leading and ask for his protection. When we build our relationship with God, God not only speaks to us, but God gives us a peacefulness. And I'm going to be honest with you. I believe that most of the problems that we're experiencing on the earth today is a result of sin. It started in the Garden of Eden, and it hadn't let up since. And the more we grow, the more we sin. But there was a day, many years ago, that the church of God was a respected entity in the eyes of the world. And we've, we've drifted from that and we've left that and we fell away from that. Why? Because the church has left their first love. Because we as a church have left what God has called us to do. Because we as a church have, have not only engaged in sinful activities, but we've harbored sinful activities. And then over the course of time and throughout the years, you can take example after example on how we begin to embrace sinful activities. And we fail to stand against sin for what it is. First of all, if we can learn to make supplications, prayers, intercessions, and give thanks to God, I believe that we will begin to see godliness and peacefulness and honesty Return to our way of living. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God. I, I was thinking this week, and, and I think I put it in the bulletin. Being satisfied in life is much better than being successful in life. Why? Because whether we are successful or not has to be measured by the thoughts, the opinions, the subjective views of other sinners. We're never going to measure up to the expectations of mankind. Ever. But a life of satisfaction can be found <coughs> when we're measuring ourselves from the inner secrets of our heart our inner soul, and our inner mind. If Jesus truly dwells within us, no greater joy will we ever find. It is good, and it is acceptable in the sight of God our Savior for the church to be a praying people. We can have 36 minutes we can have a, an annual operating budget of a half million dollars. We can be feeding 500 people a week. But if we're not praying for them, we're missing out on some blessings. In verse number four, who will have all the end <coughs> That clarifies, that further justifies exactly what it is that we should be lifting up in prayer. To have all men be saved. Why are we not reaching the communities the way God has called us to reach them? I believe it's because we're falling behind if we've not fell apart in our prayer. Person and corporate. I want you to answer this out loud. I'm not asking you to raise your hand. But is there anybody here that prays for the lost every day this week? Is there anybody here that prays for the lost on, on Wednesday night and last Sunday? I ask because I'm sure they're killed. Is there anybody here that only prayed for the lost one day? There may be people here that have prayed for the lost all week long. Maybe all month. Maybe outside of church corporate prayer, we find ourselves guilty of years of not praying for the lost. That's what this message is about today. I want us to look at the condition of the sinner. I want to make application this morning to why the condition 
condition of the sinner has to be understood in the mind of the church. I want us to understand why the condition of the sinner has to be something that we think on every day of the week. If you look at Luke chapter number 13 and verse 16 and 2 Timothy 2, 26, we will remind ourselves, or we'll allow God to remind us, that the sinner is bound by Satan. They're bound by Satan. I'm not making excuses this morning, but they are bound by Satan. Uh, Luke chapter number 13 and verse 16, Jesus is teaching and he's teaching in the synagogue. And it happened to be on the Sabbath day. And there was a woman there that was uh, afflicted for 18 years. And what did Jesus do? He healed her. He made her whole. And as soon as he did that, he was faced by the rulers of the day, the rabbis, the, the Pharisees, so to speak. And they began to condemn him because he healed somebody on the Sabbath day. And, and Jesus, he said in Luke 13, 16, he said, Ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan hath bound, lo, there 18 years, be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath day. You see, Jesus had only one thing on his mind, and that was healing people. But he didn't come to this earth to heal people and just do miracles. As he, as he healed that woman, as he gave sight to the blind, as he made the mute talk and the deaf to hear, as he made those who couldn't walk, walk again, as he raised those from the dead to live again, he was here to die on the cross to give the ultimate healing for all people. For all people. Why? Because Satan has a binding power on the face of this earth. Hey, it's not just the unsaved that Satan has a binding power on, right? Satan can bind any of us. And he's got the ability and he's got the capability to bind us and to, to, to tie us up, so to speak, to keep us from being effective. 2 Timothy 2 and verse 26 uh, is that, that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive at His will. You see, each one of us, we live with a fleshly side. We, we live with a, a part of our life that, that I don't care how big we are, I don't care how strong we are, I don't care how much money we got or how many bodyguards or how many sidearms we can carry, I don't care about any of that. We live with a side of us that is completely weak to resist the devil. That we can be taken in, that we can be taken captive. But it is God's will for us to understand the condition of the sinner. It, it, it is a power that is greater than, than them themselves. But there's hope. They can be recovered out of the snare of the devil. They're not just bound by Satan. They are blinded by Satan. Acts chapter number 26 and verse number 18. And Jesus is talking in this particular passage and he says that they can open their eyes. That they can turn from the darkness and they can turn to the light. They turn from the power of Satan and they turn back to God. That they can receive forgiveness of sin and the inheritance among them which are sanctified by the faith that is in Christ Jesus. They're blinded. By Satan. I heard it this morning, and I enjoyed the, the dialect between me and the individual. Somebody made the comment that they wasn't going to have somebody, allow somebody to come to church because it was just too cold. And, and as Christians, it's easy for us to say, that's a ridiculous, ridiculous thing to say. Isn't it? Hey, the world out there, they don't understand what we understand. We have to remember as, as we are ministering to, to the people that God has called us to minister to, we've got a different mindset. We've got a different viewpoint on some things. 
They're blinded. They don't know better. It's easy for us to sit around and, 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 and talk about different avenues of this world and different things that we see. Different sins that are just abounding and they're being normalized in our society. And we sit back and we find ourselves in our little cluster saying, well, I just can't believe that they can agree with this. They're bound. They're blinded by Satan. What do they need? They need us to pray. They need intercession. They need Jesus Christ to make a difference in their life. I see so many times today that the church we, we want the world to look at us and just say, I want to be like them. That's good. But there should be two different types of lives. We should be separated as God has saved us and, and, and sanctified us. That all things have become new. Let's be honest for just a minute. Why would the world want to take one of their two days off from a work week and come sit in a place and listen to somebody talk for an hour? Don't make sense, does it? Why in the world would, would the world want to not only do that once a day, but come back on Sunday night on an evening before they have to go back to work for seven days and do it again? Why would the world care anything about coming in here on Monday night and spending an hour talking to some man that they can't see or that they can't hear from. You get where I'm going with this? We do that. We want to because that's what we've accepted. Because we know that that is true. How are they going to know that? we got to go tell them. We've got to give them the good news of the gospel of Christ. And he's got to touch their lives, and they've got to be washed by the snow. And they've got to understand the condition that they were in for all this to make sense to them. And it starts when the church falls on our knees. And we begin to fervently pray for God to make a difference in their lives. I've heard Brother Charlie teach it. I've heard Brother Allen, Brother Arthur, almost everybody that teach in this church make this statement. We can't save a single person. And it's true. It's only when the Holy Spirit convicts them and draws them unto Him and they receive Him that a difference will be made. So why are we not petitioning God in our prayer? Why are we not praying for the unsaved? I'll tell you what we do find ourselves guilty of most often. We find ourselves guilty of 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 3 and 4. We find ourselves guilty of hiding the gospel. And when we hide the gospel, it's not hid to, to you and I that know Christ as our Savior. It's hid to the lost world around us. It's hid to those people that God has called us to serve in whom the God of this world, and that is a little g God if you're not looking at your Bible, in whom the devil, in whom Satan hath blinded the minds of them who believe not. It's only lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, the image of the true and living God, should shine upon them that they could come to be saved. Understand the condition of the sinner. Understand the condition of the world understand the condition of some of us today is that Satan has got a bind on us and we may be blind. The gospel heals and Jesus Christ is still saving but it is the church's responsibility to fall on our face and to pray. We see the condition of the sinner, we see the command of the Savior. Jesus commanded us to pray for labor. The size of the harvest is huge. And that song is ever so true. But where are the laborers? My house is full, but my field is empty. If you draw a circle around the 
center of this building, three miles wide. The Census Bureau of 2012 shows 2,580 something residents, I believe, that live within that three mile circle. The harvest is humongous, but where are the laborers? Where are the workers? Luke 10, 2 tells us the harvest is truly great, but the laborers are few. Then what does it say? Go out and recruit. Go out and beg people to come work. No. Luke 10, 12 says the, the harvest is, is truly great. The laborers are few. Pray ye, therefore, the Lord of the harvest, that he would send forth laborers into this harvest. We find ourselves guilty again. We, we try. We're doing good. We're working on it. I can go out and knock on some doors. I can go out and talk to some church members about doing more. I can, I can, I can run some, some fundraising drives and we can reach out to get some help. That's not what God commanded us to do. He said, pray ye the Lord of the harvest that I'll send you workers. Why are we struggling? I question our prayer life. Are we asking God to send us help? Do we realize that the fields are ready for harvest? John 4 and verse 35 says, Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields. They're white. They're ready for harvest. And I believe that I can proclaim today from this pulpit, if these walls weren't fumed, if we didn't have the, the film that we got on them, I could say, look outside the walls and look at the field that's white to harvest. We need laborers. We need to pray. First of all, supplications, prayer, and intercession. Give glory to God because He can overcome it. He's going to be the one that's going to draw unto us. Matthew chapter 28. You all know these verses. Very familiar set of uh, verses. We know it is the Great Commission. Jesus came and He spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye, that is, go you, go singular, individual, go you, therefore, and teach all nations. Baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost. Teach them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded. And lo, I am going to be with you always, even until the end of the earth. Do we realize this morning that we have been commanded to take the gospel to the lost? We'll see the condition of the sinner. We'll see the command of the Savior. I hope by now we can see our compassion for the sinner. Do we have compassion? Oh, we feel bad, and I mean no disrespect if anybody's watching this online, we feel bad when people are told. We feel bad when people are hungry. We feel bad when horrible things happen to people that people shouldn't go through. We feel bad when families get tore apart. Oh, we're very compassionate when people are struggling on this earth. The Christian, the church, do we really feel bad about those that are lost among us and are on their way to a dark and fiery hell, separated from all people and God for eternity? Do we have a compassion for them? When's the last time we just broke it down in our car and cried? I found myself guilty this week. A homeless man in mercy's birth. <coughs> This man needed help. And I looked at him and I began, I was thankful. And when I noticed him, I'll, I'll be honest, I, I would have I would have helped him. But I was two rings over and I just didn't get the opportunity. And I even feel bad for not turning around and going back today. I wish I could say I did, but I didn't. And I didn't because when I got feeling bad about him, I got thinking about all the names of people I know are lost and going to hell. 
And I thought, I'm sitting here crying because this man is asking for some food. But I've not been burdened in a while because my friends, some of my family, some people that are extremely connected to this church, have got no testimony of knowing Christ. And they're headed for a depth of hell for all eternity. we got to be compassionate for the sinner. Romans chapter number 10 and verse number 1. Actually, I'm going to look at 1, 2, and 3. <coughs> turn over there. I didn't make myself a note. Paul is talking in this particular passage. Paul says, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. Brethren, my heart's desire and our prayer to God is a great one. For beach grow, for coffee county, Woodbury, is that they might be saved. Brethren, my heart's desire, my prayer to God, is that my friends and my co-workers and my school buddies, they might be saved. Brethren, my heart's desire, my prayer to God, is that
she didn't understand that on the face of this earth. She had done better than her Lord. I'm going to be part of that sheep. Old sinner me. Because I haven't answered what God called me to do. Her prayer was answered. You see, don't base your prayers off of the results. Base your prayer off of your compassion for others. Base your, base your prayer life off of the burden you have for the people that are lost. Base your prayer over the level of brokenness that you can receive for those that need Christ. We have the condition of the sinner, the command of the Savior, the compassion for the sinner. We're going to wrap up this morning with the confidence of those who are saved. The confidence of those who are saved. We can have confidence in prayer because 1 John chapter 5 Verse 14 and 15 tells us of the confidence that we have in Him that if we ask anything, anything according to His will, He hears our prayer. And if we know that He hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we should have the petitions that we desire. You know, I know some people in the church have been part of court hearings this week. I've been part of court hearings this week. There's plenty more to come. But when you go to the, the courts of the secular world, you stand in a place, and you've got an opposition that stands in a place, and you're able to make your arguments, and you're able to make your petitions to the judge. That man or that woman will hear both sides and he will make a judgment. And so many times this week I, 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 I heard some defense counsels say, but your honor, if you don't mind, let me, let me just reiterate because I want to ensure that the court has heard. And it continued and continued and continued. And I got thinking, you know, that's what this verse is saying. Because we're talking to the capital J judge. We're talking to the one and only God Almighty. We're talking to the judge that's going to not make a wrong decision. We're talking to the judge that knows everything about everybody and knows every situation and what each person needs and what each person can handle. And what this is saying is, is confidence in our prayer that, that we can have confidence that to know if we if we fall on our knees, if we petition him, if we call out his name and we, we pray, he hears us loud and clear. <clears throat> no matter whether we mumble it, no matter whether we don't even say it aloud, God hears us. And whatever we ask, we can know that we have petitioned the great judge. And he will bring the desired outcome. Have confidence in that. Have confidence in our prayer, but more importantly, have confidence in our Savior. Hebrews 7.25 You see, it's only Jesus Christ that is able to save them to the uttermost that come to God. It is only through Jesus Christ who is able to save him to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he liveth to make intercession for them. You see the picture? God the Father sitting on his throne in him, and on the right hand, and, and, and this is speculation. I try to stay away from it. Sometimes I just think it, 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 it builds a good picture. This is not the Word of God. But I don't picture God sitting on the throne and Jesus sitting at the right hand of Him. I picture God sitting on a throne and Jesus at the right hand of the Father making intercession for you and for me and for all the world around us. He died for us. He paid the price for us. He wants us to be saved. 
And He's given us direct access to Him. Are we using it? Are we praying? In conclusion, some lessons that we can take out of this message. People who die without Christ are lost for all eternity. Death and hell is a terminology that we shouldn't use because it's misleading to the world that don't understand. You see, the truth is they're going to live in hell as long as we're going to live in heaven. Just under a completely different environment. Jesus died for the sins of the world so that all people could be saved. I spoke with a Jehovah Witness this week that believed in 144,000 all the mercy of salvation. I'm glad that God died for all people. I'm glad that the Bible makes it clear. Because when I evaluate myself on all the on all the figures in this world and the fruits that have been produced by men and women, I ain't gonna make a hundred and forty four thousand list. And I dare say you believe me. But God died for all people. For the whole world. That whoever Call upon his name to be saved. But are we praying? And are we sharing with those around us the need of Christ? God's salvation is for anyone who will come to him in faith and repentance. Are we praying for God to save? Him? I think it is the biggest downfall of the church. I think it is where we are failing the world we're called to serve. We can fix this at the corporate level, but we'll only do that if we can fix it at the individual level. Will we have compassion for those sinners? Hey, so bow your head and close your eyes. Miss Margie, Brother Buck, come. The invitation is clear this morning. If there's anybody here that don't know Christ as your Savior, I close this invitation I'm going to pray for you. But I want you to know that Jesus has already died for you. That you can, you can receive that salvation this morning. Brother Aaron, I, I, I've been here 30 years. It don't matter. If you don't know Christ, you're headed for an eternity in hell. There's not going to be any judgment. There will only be love. Do you know somebody that, that says they're saved, but there ain't no fruit? God knows the heart. And God's called us to pray for them. When's the last time we fell on our face and petitioned God to make a difference in our life? When's the last time we've taken the gospel and shared it? So we want to make an impact in this community. If we want to see our church more effective, we need to find ourselves guilty of fervent prayer before our God. We need to understand the condition of the sinner. We need to understand how great our Savior is. We need to have compassion. And then we need to go forth in confidence that our prayer and our Savior will impact them. Whatever it be on your heart, on your soul, on your mind, will you bring it to God this morning? Will you surrender your all? Will you say, Lord, work in my life? Brother Bob, 